You're listening to Across the Pond, a show about improving the lives of British expats living in America. Brought to you by Plan First Wealth. Hello, hello. How are you doing, Rich? I'm good, Tom. How about yourself? I am good. My uh, my wife is currently in the early stages of labour, which might sound strange that I'm doing a podcast. Uh, but uh, we've been told by the midwife that it could still be uh, three or four or five days. So she could come through the door literally at any moment, right? Yeah. So okay, so we well, could whip case, through it. Yeah. We better. Yeah, we better get a riddle on. Yeah. All right. So today's topic. Last time we tackled. Pfix. So Pfix, for those who uh, are, would love a refresher, <laughs> are essentially non-US investments, um, and it's relevant for the US person and or US citizen. Right. Today, slightly different, kind of turned around a little bit, we're talking about reporting and non-reporting funds, which is a UK thing. Mm-hmm. So this is, you. We're really we're talking about UK residents, uh, UK taxpayers, who are invested in funds, and you know, and pe- so so people might be wondering, like, well, oh, you know, you're you're you work with America, you work with British British expats in America. What, why are you doing this? And the reason being is, we uh, clients go back. Uh, we have clients who mm-hmm. move to the US for a number of years, and then go back to the UK. Some with investment portfolios in the US, uh, and others who go back as US citizens. And therefore, are you know, subject to ongoing U.S. rules and requirements. So, this is this is ostensibly not for our for the majority of our clients who are Brits in America, staying in America, but they are for a good chunk of our clients who uh, find themselves back in the U.K. So that's why we're gonna that's why we're tackling this uh, reporting versus non-reporting funds um, today. Yeah, because there are things you can do. In advance, aren't there? Which we'll cover off uh, as we get through this. Yeah. I actually think that's a key point with tax planning, investment planning, all this stuff. Is um, it's better to prepare than to repair? I didn't make that up. That's a lie hmm. from someone else. But it is. It's better to prepare than to repair. It's always going to cost you less. Well, not always, but I. It, I would argue that most of the time it's going to cost you less in financial terms and emotional stress terms to prepare for stuff like this rather than to repair it. And um, which is why we have this standing uh, standing advice always seek advice from a cross border professional always. Mm-hmm. Not and and by that I don't necessarily mean us although I do mean us but I mean primarily a tax advisor. A cross border UK US, not just a. Oh, I've got a few expat clients. A cross border UK US tax advisor. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'll move on from that because I know I say it all the time, and people are probably like, "Shut up and move on." But <laughs> it's that important, I think. And by that, and by prepare, we mean in advance of moving back to the UK, mm. and probably mm. repair would probably be someone who's already back there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, totally right. So, what are we talking about we, again? Like Pfix. And if, I, if, if, people, if people are wondering, what's on about Pfix? Uh, la, the last podcast, an earlier blog, there's a whole, a whole blog podcast video on this, but we're talking about collective investments. So we're not talking about direct shares. You own Apple stock. You own you know, treasuries, gilts, whatever. We're talking about collective investments, mutual funds, ETFs, collective investments. Right? And we're talking about offshore funds. So bearing in mind, we're, 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 we're doing this again from the perspective of, a UK, of the UK. So this is the UK uh, telling you how they treat offshore funds. Right, so what's an offshore fund? Right, by default, offshore fund um, uh, is just any non-UK fund. <laughs> right, so by that, I don't mean any fund that's not invested in the UK. I mean any fund that's not, that's not registered in the UK under the auspices of the UK, FCA, HMRC, right? Any fund that's in the US, which is obviously what is most relevant for our conversation today, or an Australian fund. Again, I don't mean a fund that invests in Australia. I mean an Australian fund. It can be invested worldwide, but it's Australian dollars in Australia for Australians primarily. Right? Anything that's not a UK fund that falls under the UK remit Mm -hmm. um, is going to be classed as an offshore fund. Now, there is a slight caveat. I don't know the answer to this. 
There's USITS funds. People might hear us talk about USITS funds. USITS, I can't, can't remember what the acronym stands for, uh, but essentially this is a, a common framework for European funds. Irish, Luxembourg, European, right? Uh, the USITS funds. USITS funds might qualify as reporting funds. I don't know, right? But again, it's not really important for our purposes of today because we are focusing on people in the UK who have US collectives, US mutual funds, US ETFs, they are offshore funds from the UK perspective. No question about it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So little asterisk, caveat next to USITs. We're not talking about USITs today. We're talking about US. US definitely qualify as or are considered offshore funds by HMRC. Yeah. So funds on a US exchange, funds that you hold in your US Fidelity account. Your US brokerage. Fidelity, account. Schwab, Trade PMR with us. Yeah. You know, Pershing, whatever. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so by default, offshore funds are non reporting. Um which means that holders of offshore funds, investors in offshore funds, must report their capital gains as what's called offshore income gains. So even if you make a capital gain, if you sell your units in an offshore fund, a non-reporting offshore fund for a gain, which you would most people would assume would be subject to capital gains tax at a maximum of 20% in the UK, if it's a non-reporting fund, it's going to be classed as an offshore income gain and it's just going to be automatically assessed against income tax up to a maximum of 45%. If we'd recorded this a week ago, <laughs> we might be saying 40%, but there's since been a U-turn <laughs> in the shambles that is the UK government right now, and, it, and it's up to a maximum of 45%. Yeah. But the point being, right, the point being is that n normally you have uh, in, um, investors in funds receive distributions in, for, in the form of income, dividends, coupons, interest, and they receive capital gains. Now, ordinarily, uh, I uh, income is subject to income tax or dividend tax. So income tax in the UK is up to 45%. Dividend tax is up to, I think, 38.1%. Right, so, so your income you receive from funds is always higher. Right, but capital gains, on the other hand, which is where a lot of the returns come from, usually, uh, is, is subject to a maximum 20%, which is obviously way more attractive. Mm -hmm. And that's what people want to avail themselves of. But if you have a non-reporting offshore fund, it's not an option. Yeah, you know, everything is going to be subject to income tax up to, as of right now, subject to another U-turn, 45%. <laughs> yeah, there's also a capital gains tax allowance in the UK, and we won't get into the minutiae on that, but there's also, yeah, you can take advantage of that if you are subject to capital gains tax versus income tax. Right, exactly. Although I wonder, would a US citizen benefit from that? I don't know. But anyway, you, we, if, it's, if, you're, if yeah. you're a person who's given up the green card or the visa, then yeah. But uh, I'm not sure a US citizen would benefit from that. Mm. Um, one for a cross-border tax advisor. Yeah. <laughs> um, right. So why do they do this? Everyone's like, well, that's not very fair. Why do they do this? They do this because the UK doesn't have oversight of it. That hence, why it's an offshore fund. So the UK doesn't have oversight of it. So what they're worried about is they're worried about these funds receiving income and then that income not being reported to them and it being uh, later crystallized, sold, and declared as a capital gain. So they're worried that investors in these offshore funds, which they have no oversight of, they have no visibility into, are going to end up benefiting from capital gains tax on income. They don't want that to happen. So to avoid that, they say, we're going to hit everything with income tax, for up to 45%. Now, that's their solution, which is pretty savage. Mm -hmm. But luckily, there is a solution, and the solution is reporting funds. For, 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 an, for an offshore fund to apply for and receive reporting fund status from HMRC. This is not something the investor can do. This is something that has to come from... Uh, this, is, this, is, this, is the, this is at a fund level. This, so this is Vanguard, Fidelity whoever, applying to HMRC for reporting fund status, right? And once status is granted to a fund, the fund will then report any income it receives 
to both, this is an important part, both HMRC and the investor. So you're an investor in, in, a, in a reporting fund. You're going to get told every year the fund has received X amount of income. You have to declare that to HMRC and pay tax on it at income tax rates or dividend tax rates, even if you don't actually receive any of the money, right? even if it's not distributed to you then. So the, the fund receives a load of income, and let's say it holds on to it or it reinvests it or it, 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 it doesn't doesn't submit it to you. You you do not get a check in the mail. Mm. You right then and there, you you get no benefit. You, you know you get you get nothing in your account. You are still going to have to declare that and pay tax on it annually. Right. So I think I call that a dry tax. Mm. And that's quite common, isn't it? Uh, as in uh, funds that will reinvest the dividends, accumulation unit mm-hmm. funds, uh, reinvest, and uh, yeah, you don't receive any any pounds or dollars, but still subject to the taxation, still ha- and you're saying you still have to pay um, mm-hmm. US yep. or UK. Yeah, yeah. Income tax on that. So yeah. you're going to get, you know, you get a $100, the, the fund receives $100, $100 and you don't you don't get that $100, but you have to declare that unit on your return and, and pay income or dividend tax on it, depending on what kind of income it is. But the flip side to that is when you do encash your units, that will presumably then uh, include some of that... Um, uh, income, any capital gains is only subject to capital gains tax, up to a maximum of twenty percent, as opposed to it all being subject to thirty-eight point one or forty-five. No, no, sorry, just forty-five percent. Mm. So that's why that's why a, a reporting fund is to be preferred because tax on capital gains is going to be much much lower. So let's just contrast that. So you have a non-reporting fund, which is most of them. And mm-hmm. which is them by default. Uh, you do not pay tax annually. You, you sorry, you do not pay tax unless you receive some money. So unless you receive a distribution, you know, unless uh, unless that fund pays some money out to you, um, that's a distribution. Mm-hmm. Um, and unless you sell some units or all the units, right? So. Three years goes by, no distributions, no sales, no tax. Sounds but, good. Yeah. <laughs> great, right? But everything you receive, capital gains or not, is going to be subject to income tax at up to 45%. Not so good. No. Versus having a reporting fund, you might be paying tax occasionally on income you haven't yet received because it stayed within the fund. Income tax or dividend tax, but... When you come to sell units for capital gain, you, you're going to pay a much, much lower rate of tax. Mm-hmm. So, And most most definitely. of the upside comes in the capital gain as well, doesn't it? Rather than the dividend distribution, generally speaking. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I think it, I think it probably probably depends on the type of fund. And dividend distributions are hugely important. You look at yeah. you look at long term charts of like uh, just the growth of an index versus the growth of an index with dividends reinvested. Like it's a critical piece of the jigsaw. Um, but yeah, you don't uh, you don't want your capital gains taxed at forty to forty five percent if you can avoid it. <laughs> you really don't. <laughs> so, right. It's not quite as serious as a PFIX because PFIX. I don't think it is anyway because PFIX. You can get into a whole mess of like reporting compliance, and then there's tax at the highest marginal rate in the US plus interest. Right, PFIX gets ugly, complicated, ugly, and messy. And PFIX are the opposite, aren't they? PFIX are basically the US people. Uh, So US residents um, buying funds overseas. Or citizens. Or citizens. Uh, Yeah, Yeah. buying funds uh, overseas, uh, collective funds overseas and being classified as a PFIX. So it's like a a US resident, uh, sorry, a US citizen in the UK buying a UK fund, which is so reasonable on the face of it can get you into a right pickle because it's a PFIC or it's most certainly a PFIC so I don't think reporting funds is quite as nasty mm. and serious but it is I uh, given the choice I would always say reporting fund over a non-reporting fund if you're a UK taxpayer with U- with offshore investments specifically here I'm thinking of US investments now there is a slight wrinkle and that is, we're talking, we're, our clients are Brits. Brits in America, 
Brits who have gone back to the UK with or without American citizenship. They are almost, if they're if a Brit back in the UK is almost certainly UK domiciled. Big topic for another conversation. Important. Going to talk about it. Not right now, but just take my word for it. If you're a Brit back in the UK, even if you've got American citizenship, you're probably still UK domiciled. An American, an American American. <laughs> So an Amer- born American, moved to the UK, you may still be considered non-UK domiciled, US domiciled, non. And the, the, again, the situation might be different for you. You might you might want a non-reporting fund or a reporting. Not my over expertise. I just know it's a slight wrinkle that American Americans in Britain <laughs> should be aware of. So if that's you, I would expect Americans in Britain understand. How oh, I hope they understand how complicated things are for them, and I bet they're already taking advice. But if if you ha- if you're an American American who happens to be listening to this, just know there's a wrinkle, and know you should seek cross border um, advice mm-hmm. to make the right choice. The really? what what about so you're a a Brit moving back to the UK, you have a four hundred one k or an IRA, and that holds. Uh, funds in the US, so they'll be classified as offshore funds. What's the should should someone do something about that before they move back to the UK? Right, that's a good question, and this, I'm going to give two answers, one of which is I don't know, but I'll expand on that because it's not very helpful. So there's two, and I, I, I get, right usual caveat: not a tax advisor, and even within the tax advisor community that I c- I can ascertain, there is differing opinions on this. So, there's a robust treaty, a tax treaty, between the UK and the US, and that tax treaty has pensions or retirement account articles. And my understanding is that these articles get, uh, offer a, a level of protection, for want of a better word, to people who've got retirement accounts, pensions, IRAs, 401ks. And essentially, I think that the uh, it means that the tax, the, the 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 other party, so in this case HMRC, looks at the IRA or the eight four hundred one k and says, "Oh, okay, it's a retirement account," and it kind of stops there. They don't look through to the underlying reporting funds, right? Because uh, my again, my understanding, there's no tax to pay within a four hundred one k or an IRA until it's withdrawn, most of the time, mm-hmm. generally, right? So, my understanding is, I believe. Uh, Reporting f- non-reporting funds are okay within a 401k IRA because of the treaty and the fact you're protected by the the, the a, a recognised retirement account wrapper, and vice versa with UK pensions. Right, they are they are they may be okay to hold PFIX because of the same treatment, the, the same analysis of the treaty. However, there are people who argue differently and who uh, advise clients not to hold PFIX. So I sh- PFIX, I'm, I'm talking here now of people who are advising US people not to have PFIX in retirement accounts, SIPs, UK pensions, because uh, you know, because you could get yourself into a pickle that like we talked about before. And therefore I would assume that they would make the same argument for reporting funds. So yeah, like, like well, I think we talked about this last time. It's just a murky, grey area full of nuance. Mm. And you speak to five different tax advisors and get five different opinions. I see a lot of different tax returns and tax forms. Five different tax advisors, five different ways of doing these different informational forms. It, it, my mind boggles, honestly. Uh, and, the, and I guess, and I guess, therefore, there's the ultra. You can go on the ultra conservative route. Route. I've been here too <laughs> long. Or the the more pragmatic. I think that might be the right term. Hmm. Um, and the ultra-conservative route uh, would be stocks. If you it held... Be non- it, well, well, if you're a... If you have a UK pension and you're a US resident, I'd say you know, direct assets or US collectives. If you're a... If you're investing in a 401k IRA, reporting funds. Yeah, reporting but like, there's no tax to pay, so because you you mm. do have the protection of the wrapper, so why would it really matter? 
Yeah. So maybe it wouldn't. I don't know. Maybe I, maybe I've maybe I've gone a leap too far there. Maybe I've made a jump that doesn't exist, right? So yeah. I think with the problem with P fix in a pension is yes you've got the protection of the pension wrapper, but there's still PFIX and there's a level of US compliance with PFIX, Form 8621, you know, yada, yada, yada. I don't think the same exists with reporting funds in the UK. It's just because you don't have to report them annually. You know, there's no informational reporting in the UK, in my understanding. It's just you have to report um, your, your, your worldwide income. So maybe I've made maybe I've made a leap there that's, that's that doesn't exist, but... Mm. The, the main point, which is the, 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 which this is a difficult area and nuance, and, and you want a cross border tax advisor, still stands. Yeah, and and, and look, we're, we're primarily talking here about, well, exclusively talking about people who have got like unwrapped, what we call unwrapped investments. You know, a brokerage account. There's no, there's no tax wrapper, which retirement account pension protecting it. You're holding these investments directly. Mm-hmm. And what, how how can you best? maximize the efficiency tax efficiency and and reporting headaches Mm -hmm. come with it yeah and you say vanguard vanguard are renowned for having a lot of these reporting funds you know if i keep talking about pfix i promise i wouldn't and i know i have but you know if your pfix is a bit of a nightmare for an american but reporting for navigating this is a lot easier for the UK person, because HMRC, you make a list available on their website of all the reporting funds or funds that have reporting status. And also Vanguard make it extra easy by having a lot of funds on there. So it really, it's, one, it's, a, it's a case of awareness more than anything. Mm-hmm. Be aware of this. And ideally, I think you hit the nail on the head, take, prepare. You know, it's, it's better to find this out before you move. Uh, than it is 10 years down the line sat mm. on hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of gains because there's not much can be done at that point yeah. rather than unwinding it and fixing it for the future. Yeah, we had a client last year look to go back, sat on hundreds of thousands of gains and it was hundreds of thousands probably taxed in the UK at 45% or uh, before they go back, pay, move them into the right funds and pay capital gains tax in the US at 15%. Twenty percent, um, mm-hmm. and then when now that they're in these reporting funds, and they're back in the UK, any time they do sell something, it will be taxed at UK capital gains there rates. You go. Like it saved, it saved tens of thousands. Yeah. So, and this is this is the we, we are not tax advisors, but we spot these things. Mm. Uh, we are the canary down the coal mine. <laughs> we see, we have oversight over a lot of stuff, and also we're not that kind of. Tax advisors are very good at filling out the forms and ticking the right boxes. I hope. <laughs> I hope they're good at that. <laughs> but I think uh, we're better at spotting the bigger picture stuff and saying, oh, have you, you thought about that? And um, then saying you should speak to someone about it. So uh, we, the um, a note for for the American in Britain. So if you are a Brit who's gone back to the UK and you have American citizenship your investment universe is substantially narrowed in that if you want to invest in collectives, which most people do, mutual funds, OICs, ETFs, you are stuck between a bit of a rock and a hard place. The rock being PFIX, so any, not any, most, vast majority of UK GBP funds, mutual funds, ETFs are going to be classed as PFIX and you know, if you get it in time, there's an election available, but it's still not good, even with an election. Mm-hmm. You just so you, you you really want to avoid that, which means your you, your best option is if you want to invest in that currency is direct shares, which is a different ball game altogether. And if you want to say, all right, screw this, this is too hard, I'll just keep it in dollars and accept the currency risk, and and I'll and I'll keep investing in my JPMR, Fidelity, Schwab, whatever. You want to stick to reporting funds. Much easier to do. Mm-hmm. Then you've got the currency risk problem. But just, again, totally navigable, totally doable, better to know about it, and be be prepared, uh, and try to uh, minimize any missteps. Thorough. I hope we uh, managed to, uh, everyone managed to follow along. Yeah, I'm just trying to think what's next. Oh. Oh. What's next is... uh, um, NT tax code and oh, okay. tax reporting in the US. So, um, 
Yeah, they, t- t- we're kind of mingling two different things here. NT tax code is a is a British thing. Mm-hmm. N- non tax paying code, I mean here, uh, and US reporting, which is something that just is just so it just trips up so many people, everyone, because it's difficult and idiosyncratic. <laughs> so that's the next one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, technical potentially those uh those pieces and you said something earlier actually rich which uh it took me a few years to grasp when working with working in america with brits in america it's the gray area and it's always going to be a gray area which took me years to sort of finally grasp because the irs or the hmrc are never going to comment in their tax documents specifically on every single account Overseas, every single account in Australia or South Africa or the UK or Europe, there's always going to be opinion. A lot of this can be found in the tax treaty that we've talked about before, but still, it's not going to go to the level of depth because of consistent changes in the UK pension system or the US system. It's always changing every year as new political parties and people come in that they just can't keep up. So there's always grey area, there's always tax opinion. Um, and there's, there's, there's always a, a need for specialist advice, really. Totally. The, the way I see it, because like you, that, that took took a while to sink in. Because I just, you come from an environment in the UK where, you know, it's a UK pension, therefore this is a treatment. And in, uh, that's the same in the UK. It's a, U, it's a US retirement account. There is US legislation, US law that governs this. It's two plus two equals four. Mm-hmm. You know, it's all set out in codes and, and law. It's really simple. And then we operate in this area where there's just gray area, nuance, and everything is an interpretation. So, like you say, the US is going to legislate on US retirement accounts. It's not going to legislate on UK retirement accounts. Because if it legislates on UK retirement accounts, it would have to legislate on the other 180 <laughs> different... Can you imagine? So what it is, it, it, there's, there's articles in these treaties that says, right, if, if, a, if an asset has this attribute, it's a pension, and it's treated this way. This is my rudimentary, or relatively rudimentary understanding of how these things work. Mm. And then there's always room for interpretation. So one guy looks at it in person, guy or gal, looks at it and says, oh, yeah, that's, that's, that counts as a pension. Another person will say, oh, no, no, that's insurance wrapper. And then someone would say, oh, well, this, this clause applies. And then someone else would say, no, no, that clause doesn't apply because the, this one precedes it. And, and it's, yeah, so I, I, what, I, what we, I think we try and do is um, select the most, we, I think we try and go down the most conservative route whilst remaining pragmatic. And again, this isn't driven by us. This is driven by tax professionals. We're the implementers <laughs> of that stuff. But mm-hmm. I, I, I am... Uh, disinclined to ever take a what's the word you know a uh, stance an aggressive stance on stuff mm. because that just sounds stressful and mm. not worth it yeah go with the masses and the, and the thing with the UK US there is a robust treaty mm. which is helpful but it is a grey area there is interpretation <laughs> This guy over here is going to say one thing. This girl's going to say another thing. This person's going to say another thing. Two of them are going to say it because they haven't got a clue. They don't even know what PFICs are. Someone else is going to have a clue and have a different opinion to the other person. Yeah. Yeah. The next, then next year the rules change and then they've all got to have a <laughs> <laughs> another look at it. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Okay. Jolly good. Right. So hopefully that's helpful for people who are going back or may go back or are back. Um, mm-hmm. That's investments. We've dealt, dealt with uh, PFIX and reporting and non-reporting funds. And we have the delightful topic of uh, NT tax code and uh, US reporting. Then just to remind it to everyone, we've got this 12-month content calendar where this is the fifth month. Go on our website, check it out, see if what we've done is relevant, what we're doing is relevant. Every, we've categorized it into four qu- four topics, three three parts for each topic. And at the end of each quarter, we do a, a live webinar. You can join and ask live uh, and ask questions. Uh, so that will be this one will be in December, the next one. Mm-hmm. And we have a Facebook group called Plan First Wealth Hub, which is a community just for British expatriates 
living in America or have lived in America back in the UK and we post in there, we encourage questions or comments and we plan to start doing a regular Q&A. So if people mm. want to ask us a question, if we know the answer, we'll, an- we'll answer it. Um, if we don't, we'll try and find it and come back to you another time and see if we can help that way. Yeah. So please go on our website, check out the content calendar, see if you're interested in the old topic, see if you're interested in the webinar, join the join the group, participate. We'll see and you we'll in there. And help if we can. Yeah. Mm. Thanks for listening to this episode of Across the Pond. This podcast is brought to you by Plan First Wealth. For more information about Plan First Wealth and Across the Pond, visit us at planfirstwealth.com. If you like this episode, consider sharing it with fellow Brits across the US. You can subscribe to future episodes in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. The information in this podcast is educational and general in nature and does not take into consideration the listener's personal circumstances. Therefore, it is not intended to be substitute for specific, individualized financial, legal, or tax advice. To determine which strategies or investments may be suitable for you, consult the appropriate qualified professional prior to making a final decision.